Hi, I'm Rusty Dorden from the Kaufman Fellows Academy and welcome to our Startup CEO Roundtable uh, with a few of the colleagues from Startup CEO, people who are sole founders here and who are going to share some of their experiences and perhaps hopefully some other people will join us and ask some questions and talk a little bit about some of the experiences they're having, some of the frustrations, uh, some of the ways they figured around the frustrations and that sort of thing. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Mariah Lichtenstern. Uh, she has started a company called CineShares, and Mariah, why don't you go ahead and just give us a brief rundown on that, uh, just a brief summary of what CineShares is all about. Okay, CineShares is a online platform, um, and I created it to allow users to watch movies, make movies, and fund movies in a collaborative way. Okay, that sounds pretty interesting. Um, Stephen Webster uh, has been very active on the site. Some of, he may have helped some of you with the, some of your problems. I know he's jumped in on the on the forums. Uh, Stephen, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? I know you sold actually sold a startup uh, a few years ago and are now trying to put one together as part of the class. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Rusty. So yeah, back in 2005, I had a software consultancy which I sold through Adobe, and so I've worked for Adobe for several years and for the last two years for Microsoft, and consistently in those organizations, I've actually been asked to build startup organizations inside of you know, these billion-dollar software companies, so mm -hmm. a founder where my venture backer also pays my salary. Um, so that's been interesting, but um, I was actually interested in this course because I'm keen to get more general managers and leaders inside of Microsoft to treat this kind of entrepreneurial course as better training than traditional management and leadership. So that's why I joined the course. But um, I used the project uh, that some friends and I had been working on the side called Grant Funding. Um, that was my exercise to go through to go through the startup CEO course. And Grant Funding is um, many startups that I've advised. Um, we see the same problem of how should we split equity amongst founders. And uh, I think um, you know, in one of our previous hangouts, the, the recommendation was don't split it evenly at the beginning. And uh, there's actually a solution to that called dynamic equity splitting. So we're building a platform and making it available to startup CEOs to help them think about how they can attract other co-founders and fairly split the equity amongst people uh, as they build the bootstrap part of the business. Great, and we can talk a little bit more about that as we go in the Hangout. Um, also, we are, I want to introduce Farah Prasad. He is CEO of Elegantra, which is a customer management product. And uh, Vara, you were telling me a little bit about you help manage uh, small businesses, right? Yeah, service-oriented small businesses. Pardon me? Service-oriented small businesses. And a little bit more. Tell us a little bit more. OK. Uh, so I'm not a sole founder. I have a partner with me. We started working on this idea for almost two years, and I were started working full time only for the last six seven months. So I did the juggling act of day shift and night shift, you know, working for a company. So I gave up at some point, saying, "Well, I can't do that anymore. Uh, my company needs more focus than I can do this day shift night shift." So I quit that. Uh, but my partner is still doing the day shift, night shift business. Uh, we just uh, hired last week another person who is like a, uh, not a partner, but an early founding person. Um, so from my business, what I'm trying to solve the problem is I'm trying to, uh, my focus is uh, service-oriented small businesses. And in the service-oriented small business, like the restaurants or the pedicure, manicure places, wherever you go, the service is a very important part. Uh, but these businesses don't have tools to measure the customer satisfaction, uh, which is the very important part of a service oriented. So we're trying to convert the art of customer satisfaction into science with actionable analytics. Okay. Um, let's go back and just talk about some of the hardest things you guys have had to address, you know, getting companies off the ground either by yourself or with a, with a co-founder. Mariah, you know, I know you've been struggling with bootstrapping. Um, are you thinking about trying to fundraise and are you having problems with that? What are you thinking about? Um, yeah, so over, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> getting over a, a little cold, but when I first started out um, with the independent production company as a sole proprietor, I was going into graduate school to learn how to break into the motion picture industry. And so, you know, it was a lot of small contracts and that was my bootstrapping mechanism um, really to this to this day, working part-time jobs, taking on contracts. Now that I'm launching CineShares, I really wanted to move from that 
um, Robert Kiyosaki S quadrant into a more enterprising um, quadrant where I'm not focused on you know clients and 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 job solving my problem of needing to pay the bills, but really solving problems for others. Um, and so now with CineShares, you know, addressing this huge problem of filmmakers trying to break in, investors trying to find the right, you know, uh, movies to invest in uh, with tr more transparency than what is traditionally found in the motion picture industry, and with audiences wanting to see movies in new, convenient ways, you know, I, I really wanted to branch out, and I do want to fundraise. Um, we are looking at crowdfunding as our, you know, phase one uh, seed round, so to speak. And I think it's good in a multitude of ways. Number one, uh, crowdfunding is very popular in the film industry now for independent films, but it's very limited because you can't do a Hollywood film on a crowdfunding budget. And so part of CineShares has a crowdfunding component to help filmmakers through that development process and to get that green light. And part of what it does is it shows that you're, you have audience engagement. So it helps to validate the audience. So I think it's a great way for CineShares to highlight our own platform, to engage our audience, and um, to you know create awareness and raise capital without diluting equity necessarily um, at that stage. And to prove to BC, hey, guess what? We have an audience. It's proven. You know, look at these people who are behind us, ready to be ambassadors for CineShares. So that's our that's our plan. Great. Well, you know, is there anything that you'd even like to ask the other folks here talking about other types of uh, fundraising and that sort of thing. I know Steven's gotten or already sold one of his uh, a little startup that he had. Is there anything you'd like to ask the other folks? Yes, I just uh, connected with Steven on LinkedIn. Thank you. Right. And uh, I, I perused his um, participation in the forums and I'm very thankful to Nova Ed for the heads up because I wasn't aware that he had posed these questions in the forum. But I'm very interested in what Stephen is doing with grant funding because I do have partners and prospective partners that I'm reaching out to, and of course, you know, everybody wants to know what's in it for me. So I'm interested in hearing more from Stephen. I have, you know, many questions for the, pre the professors and you, Rusty, in terms of building an international business. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the questions I have. I have others, but those are a couple that. Well, Stephen, go ahead and talk a little bit. I mean, about about the the, the concept because I know Vara, you have a you have a co-founder or you have other partners, so you may be interested in this as well. So let's let's talk a little bit about more about grant funding and what right. it's what. Happy to do so. I think when I when I formed my first startup, which is back in like 2001, 2002, I was very lucky. I did exactly what I'm now telling people they shouldn't do, which is <laughs> I, I found a partner and we went 50-50. Now it was someone I'd only worked with for a small period of time. I think we'd worked together for six months, and then I had this idea for a software consultancy, and I said, let's go 50-50, um, and let's bootstrap this business together, and we slowly won customers, enough customers we could hire more people and build an office and go through the whole cycle. Um, and I was really lucky because I think we, we did the same amount of work, we added the same amount of value, and on exit, we deserved, um, we deserved an even share um, of the business. But... Um, Grant funding is really from an observation. Uh, you know, the, the observation really with grant funding is that's that's the exception. It's not the norm. I think you look at examples like Facebook um, or uh, Snapchat. Uh, there's many stories where um, at some point down the line, usually when money's involved, yeah. um, at some point down the line, somebody feels like they did more than they're getting their share for, or there's a sense that. There was an agreement in place, maybe a gentleman's agreement or a handshake or an implied agreement. And so, you know, the, the, the whole premise of grant funding and the, the, the idea wasn't ours. Uh, the, this idea of a dynamic equity split was first proposed by Noam Wasserman in one of his, a great book called The Founder's Dilemma. Um, it's like the 10 things that sink a startup. And one of them is fixing your equity split in stone at the very beginning because you've no recourse if suddenly, or you have complex recourse, if suddenly somebody isn't pulling their weight, or somebody moves to the other side of the country, or <coughs> two of you commit to give up your full-time jobs and then the third person doesn't. Um, and it's also very hard to bring other people into the business because, um, you know, Maria, you and I might go into business together, but then suddenly we think, man, we need a designer, you know, we need a designer. But I might be very attached to my equity, and I don't want to give away you know, like 15% of my equity to a designer. So the idea of a dynamic equity split basically says, let's all track our contributions in that bootstrapping phase. This only works in bootstrapping when there's no real money and salary. Um, 
you know, let's just track all of our contributions. Let's acknowledge and agree on some things up front and that everyone's time is not equal. If I, if I can do a startup with Matt, he's, an hour of Matt's time is worth more than an hour of my time. Uh, so let's agree those fundamentals up front. Um, if one of us brings cash, cash, you know, cash is more valuable than time. And so we just agree up front the relative weighting of our contributions. We collaborate and track our contributions. And then at some point in the future, if there's a funding event, you have a successful crowdfunding campaign, or you raise friends and family or angel, then basically a very quick algorithm runs that looks back at all the contributions people have made and suggests to you this is how you should split the equity. So your equity split is based on the effort that everybody individually put in to get you get you to the point where somebody was first prepared to put a value on the business. So, wow, uh, you know, this really resounds with me because I've also been involved in a startup where we took almost a year before we started to decide how to split the equity and it was very hard then. And of course then the, the, the company ended up failing, but uh, so it didn't matter in the end. But uh, so Vara, what, what do you think, you're hearing this, you're involved with some partners now, Is this does this make sense to you or what do you think about this? Um, so it's an interesting idea. It definitely has a value in the marketplace, but uh, oftentimes, in my case, we and my partner pretty much started in the beginning. We worked together, and since I'm the one who's putting up the dollars, and who I'm the one who's came up with the idea, and I'm the one who's putting up the dollars, it was fairly easy for both of us to understand who has more value. Uh, to the business then who has less value and uh, likewise we agreed upon equity. So one problem I see though is if you don't agree upon an equity and you say okay we'll decide when the funding event comes how much of an equity who is going to get, then there are issues of uh, uh, acquiring, like for example in our company none of us own any shares from the day one. You have to gain, the, uh, just like any other employee you have a vesting schedule even for the founders. So if you want to go the founders vesting schedule model, if you don't agree upon some kind of a equity percentage and the overall number of shares, it's not going to work out uh, the equity uh, the vesting model. That's one issue if you don't do it up front. What I do understand in, in Steven's idea is you can start with something and say this is subject to revalidation at the time of the, uh, at the event of a funding where the clauses clearly say this is your current equity, this is your vesting rate. Both could have the same or any number of the people could have different vesting schedules, same vesting, it doesn't matter. But at the time of the uh, funding, you could go through the history and say who did what and then try to convert this soft fuzzy thing into more analytical. But the problem is it is not easy to say uh, in some cases like one hour of my time is worth more than one hour of my partner's kind of a thing, right? Uh, you can just, uh, People can argue all along because a lot of subjectivity is there. They may say, yeah, you work 20 hours a day, but uh, you're not as productive as I am. So those are very, very difficult things to measure, especially if somebody is focused on a lot of soft things, it's not like writing the code part, which is there is much easier to measure. Whereas if I'm focused on acquiring the teams, motivating the teams, and talking to customers, all those things, you can put the numbers saying, oh, I talked to 20 customers. I spent you know, like two hours, like for example, the person whom we got, my partner spent on and off time for more than a year to convince him of what we are working on to join the company. I spent uh, like 10 hours or something like talking to convince. So then we can argue, this right here is a simple example. Is my 10 hours a lot more effective to convince this person versus this one year on and off working of my partner, right? For example, uh, we can argue one way or the other. You can argue until the cows come home, but there's no way to prove who is right or wrong. I think, uh, I, think uh, I would slightly disagree, actually. I think um, when you hire somebody in a real company, you agree up front their salary. I mean, that's the, that's the fundamental negotiation is uh, um, I know if I hire a junior designer versus a 10 years of experience software engineer, their salaries, their market value is different. Um, and if they work full time, if they each work 40 hours a week, their salaries are disproportionate. But if the person earning the higher salary works half the time as the person earning the lower salary, there's a balance. So I think your, your, your concerns are valid. But um, yeah, I would encourage people to you know, go to the source and look at the, look at the rationale behind the model. And it's, it's a little bit more straightforward. And I think really what it's about, and 
I think if we, you know, rather than me just pitch a business, if I could back up to a, a meta point, um, the earlier you have these conversations, uh, the, the clearer the expectations are going in amongst the founders, uh, the better. And whatever framework you choose to use, uh, so long as there's clarity and people feel that they're uh, being treated fairly, I think that would echo kind of Matt's comments in some of the lectures. Is, uh, it's all about transparency and trust. From that. And I think Matt really stresses that. I mean, uh, I was so impressed with him when we were doing the filming and all that and how much he addressed transparency and how important that is. It inspires loyalty as well in people. And for people to do, I think, when you're transparent, I think people have more give and take um, and are willing to be perhaps more flexible if they feel you are really laying all of your cards on the table. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Transparency is one of the most important things uh, in building a trust in any organization or any relationship. I absolutely agree. Stephen, I just want to go back to you. Uh, the earlier comment I mentioned about the example. For example, that my partner worked for a year to convince this person. I worked for 10, year, 10 hours to convince this person. So finally, we got him on the board. But the question I'm trying to say is, we can argue saying who is more effective. You worked for a year. Was that effective to bring the person on board? Or is my 10 hours of discussion is more effective? That's where I'm saying is subject to. In this case, we have no problem. We are very happy with, and we don't care who is effective. And we are very happy with the person who is on the board. And he understands that he has talked and he had concerns, which is very you know, true in any startup. If you are the first guy to join, you'll always have concerns. So the That's point I'm trying to say is I it is not looking at Steven's model. For grant funding, I had a question as to whether um, there were results-oriented ways of looking at it as well as time commitment. I, I noticed in the model there was like, you know, spent so much time setting up uh, social networks. Um, so, you know, the value of that time, I guess, is negotiable, but um, I, I was curious if there were ways to measure results. Yeah, so there's a great way. Could be more effective in 10 hours in sales than another, for example. Great. There's a great book called uh, Slicing Pie. If, if anybody goes to slicingpie.com, Mike Moyer, who I've uh, got introduced to through the Startup CEO course, somebody sent my uh, video uh, to Mike, and that, that was great, because I, I planned on speaking with Mike. So uh, Mike does a good job of suggesting an approach for that. For instance, in sales, um, again, as, as bootstrap startups, we're no different to a large organization. I've worked in sales organizations, and what you get paid by the hour isn't the true measure of the impact you have on the company's bottom line. It's like, how much do you sell? Uh, and so the, the way you structure uh, incentive for sales guys is to you know, load them heavily on the commission side, give them a, a, share, of, you know, a share of revenue, a 10% or 15% commission. So in grant funding, you can do exactly the same thing. You can say, actually, this person's more about biz dev, they're more about sales. And so whether it takes them 10 hours or 100 hours to close a deal, it doesn't matter. The value is a customer with a $2 million deal. And so what you can do is basically say, you know, you know you're know, you incented not on hours, you're incented on commission. And that money they would have made, again, because you're bootstrapping, let's say I did a $1 million deal and made a 100K commission on it. That's just like me putting 100K of cash back into the business. I basically take the sales commission and I put it straight back into the business and I defer it as equity. So you incentivize people with a commission. You tell them that that commission is staying in the company and converting to equity. And it's just like they made a cash contribution to the business, which is exactly what they've done. So there are ways you can All these edge cases are absolutely the right questions to ask. And uh, Mike does a really good job of suggesting ways of covering. covering these edge cases. By the way, too, I wanted you mentioned Noam Wasserman. And I was uh, fortunate enough to do a filming with him. For, he addressed the Kaufman Fellows Academy from some things from his book about the Founder's Dilemma, and I can't recommend it highly enough. He is an amazing guy, okay. and uh, it's a really great book. Uh, Noam, N-O-A-M, Wasserman, W-A-S-S-E-R-M-A-N. He, he, that book is great. Yeah. Um, are any of you thinking about, you're talking about mostly bootstrapping and all that, but are, and you're talking, and Mariah, you've been talking about crowdfunding, but are, are you, any of you thinking about trying to go in and do some fundraising, and have you approached any of that? I apologize here for the phone in the background. This is, I'm not at my own place. <laughs> yes, that's something I've, I'm actually <sighs> looking at. I apologize. Okay, well, I won't feel bad if my phone goes off. I think I turned it down. <laughs> but uh, it's something that, you know, uh, I am looking at, in fact, uh, one of my teammates in the Novo Ed platform and I were talking about Chris Lip's um, book and forthcoming course on um, the pitch 
and framing that. So I'm still receiving the wisdom, and it's just um, Chris just does an amazing job. I started reading his book, and um, yeah, that's certainly something that you know I have no no alternative but to look at because crowdfunding can only do so much. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at producing films, they don't have to be you know the tentpole, hundred million dollar blockbuster superhero budget um, to be successful. Um, you could certainly produce an independent film on under five or even under you know one million dollars. Fruitvale Station is one of my um, recent favorites. Or you look at the Beasts of the Southern Wild, which is like the new Blair Witch or My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Um, so <laughs> even though we can produce films on a lower budget, in order to to scale, we're still looking at multiple millions of dollars. I mean, fifty million, twenty million, you know, on the lower level to start a slate of um, of productions and have successful print and advertising campaigns. Right. So, um, you know, that's not going to be done crowdfunding. Right. And I do want to, you were talking about Chris Lip, you know, because we did do also a class with Chris, and he is great. I mean, he really goes through, like, the slides and all of that stuff that you have to do for your pitches and everything and does a great job with that. Um, and I think, Mariah, you might have signed up for venture deals. I'm not sure. But I would, even if you don't take our class, but I hope you do, um, Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson do an amazing job of, even if you don't want to vent, you're not looking for venture money, they really go through how you need to structure your, your deals, whether it's with an angel or any other kind of investor of, of what you need to do and, you know, what kind of valuation you should do on the company initially, you know, that sometimes the lower valuations are bit better for, you know, so you don't get diluted in the end and that sort of thing. But I can't recommend enough um, their perspective and also they're very down to earth like Matt is. Um, very, very much the same perspective. Brad has been on Matt's board for like 12 years or something like that. So wow. those guys are really great for teaching about how to raise money. I've actually never read Brad's book twice. I, uh, I decided, so I signed up for the course as well. You've got me <laughs> on these courses. Um, and I uh, actually talking about, you know, we were speaking earlier about working holidays and I did exactly that. I sat on the beach last week and read Matt's, uh, uh, Brad's book from cover to cover. So uh, yeah, it's a great book. It's a great book. <laughs> you know, I think we had Tendai join and I did not see him join. Did anyone see him? It says that he joined the group and I, I, I have not seen him come up. I'm he's... looking at my emails at the side of my eye. I keep checking to see if there's something from him. I know. I just it said he joined the group chat. He left and then and and joined and left. And I know Farad, you want to go ahead and ask Mariah I, I, it, the the book by Chris. It's Chris Lip L I P P, and the name of the course and the and the book is called Startup Pitch. And it is on Amazon now. He just got it on Amazon, uh, and the he offered the course through Novoed about. I don't know, a couple months ago, and it's going to be coming up again, I think, the beginning of May, I think we're going to be offering that again. Um, I'm a Kindle reader. <laughs> pardon me? Oh, you've got it right there. I'll have to tell them that, too. Uh, is there anything else you guys would like to ask each other, too, again, about what, what you're doing or problems you're encountering, that sort of thing? How about time management? Is that becoming an issue in terms of trying to, to put your companies together? The time management is, is always an issue. Uh, I mentioned earlier I have a three-year-old. I'm very fortunate in that um, as, you know, being able to contract and um, be a consultant, I have a, a lot more flexibility than many people may have. Um, of course, there's like that risk-reward. Um, I also live in Sacramento, which is far less expensive than living in Silicon Valley, for example, so I'm able to be a lot leaner, but that also means, you know, taking trips and commuting and managing that aspect of, you know, time because I'm not in the optimum, you know, geography for either the motion picture industry or, you know, uh, startup, so to speak. Um, but having uh, having my daughter, um, you know, it does, it, it, it enhances my life in one way because I get to raise my own child, but then on the other hand, I have to, you know, work that into my schedule and tag team with my husband with child care and, you know, um, it's definitely a consideration, I think, especially for women. And my mother passed away recently, and um, that's part of me being in this geography. I've been here for eight years now. And, uh, you know, managing caregiving of both a child and an aging parent um, has definitely played into my startup story. So I think it's, um, it's, it's critical, and, and I'm very encouraged by, 
you know, recent um, changes and discussions from Lean In to, uh, you know, I, uh, Sir Richard Bronson has put out some articles on uh, women in entrepreneurship. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in, you know, new paradigms for time management that factor in that work-life balance. I think they apply to men too, but they're being framed in the context of women. So, um, yeah, it, it, time management is... It's critical. I think time management, I mean, I'll, Stephen, I'll, I'll come to you in one second. The thing that I really notice is the difficulty in being present with other people because you're so consumed by your project and your startup and that sort of thing. It's, that's something I've always found very difficult is to let that go and to be present. And I, Brad Feld, I was mentioning him again in his blog, he talks a lot about that kind of stuff about, you know, entrepreneurs dealing with stress and the kinds of things that you need to try to do to, to help yourself deal with all of this. Anyway, Stephen, I think you were going to say something. No, yeah, I was. I think, you know, I wish I'd, uh, I wish I'd met Matt before I did my first startup. <laughs> um, I was younger, uh, so I think I had more energy as well. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those two phrases my team still use to this day. Um, yeah, I mean, we all know the phrase that you'll um, allow a task to, to expand to fill the time available. Uh, it's one goalpost, and the other is... Uh, there's nothing like a deadline to sharpen the mind. And I think giving yourself deadlines and uh, really sort of thinking about how much time do I need to spend on this? Otherwise, um, it's so easy. And on my first startup, I, I wrote a book. In fact, I'm actually looking at a copy of it. I forgot it was over here. Um, I wrote a book as I was building my startup as a sales technique. Um, and so I literally was the person at 3, 4 a.m., you know, sitting writing, writing a book. And if I could do it again, I wouldn't have started work until 2 p.m. because I knew that my writing time, I knew that my creative time was the evening, and I would sit and procrastinate between 9 and 2, pretending to myself that I was you know, making progress. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wish for myself that I'd spent that time with friends or just being a little bit more present. Now I find myself, I mean, I wish I worked a 40 hour week at Microsoft. That's not an advert for Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, I work long hours and I'm you know, putting energy into other startups and I'm putting energy into grant funding. But I still have time for my wife. I still have time for my dogs. I still have time for my hobbies. And uh, you know, Matt nailed it. What Matt said would be my answer to the question. He's done a really good job of thinking about time boxing and prioritizing and finding time for yourself and uh, finding time for your family. Vara, how about you? How are you dealing with it? So, like I said, to me, the most precious thing in the world is time because everybody has the same 24 hours and every day starts with the same 24 hours. And you can never get everything done in your list of you know, to-dos in 24 hours. So I try to focus on what is the most important thing for that given day. I will always have my backlog thing and then just pull out the stuff that you care about that day and have a uh, have little bit of slots of time that is flexible I have to go pick up my daughter in the school or I have to take her somewhere. I've, as long as I don't have customer meetings scheduled, I, if I have something to do, I'll push it out tonight and I would always prioritize during the day my family first during the day. I work late in the nights. I'm a night owl right from my childhood. Uh, I'm trying to cut it down that time to a little more bearable time, unlike 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. I put an alarm in the uh, my phone so that, and uh, if that alarm buzzes at 12:30, I purposefully hit snooze button. I never hit done button so that after four or five snoozes, it'll annoy me and I'll say, okay, I'm going to close this thing. The other problem I have is my team is all offshore, uh, so I have my night meetings in the night. And after the meeting, I don't get paid or I don't get work done with meetings. You get whatever, <laughs> you get your business moving forward when you do the work. So meetings are sometimes a drain, but I still get action items out of the meeting. I have to finish them before their end of the day. That's another problem that forces me to stay up in the night. But I'm trying to uh, bring some more predictability in terms of what is expected from them and what do I expect to them and what is the deadlines I want to give to them and what is the timeline I give it to them myself to go back to them with the action item that I take in the meeting so I don't have to work too late in the night but uh, the best thing I like about this is during the day I can easily prioritize my time to be with my family more so than uh, work inside so that's how I balance that out but it is always a struggle. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's always a struggle. 
I think I love the maths, that spreadsheet model. I mean, I don't use a spreadsheet, but the ideas from the spreadsheet, I have my own implementation of it. I'm nowhere close to what Matt is in terms of his ability to organize and stick to it and follow up and all. But he provided a very good incentive or good model, I should say, for me to get there. Now, I'm hoping in a year or so, I will get much better than what I am today using Matt's model. So that was a very valuable thing. I mean, it's just another example is, I'm not getting enough time to finish my homework or the videos <laughs> for the class. I'm hoping well, I will have the videos available for a little more time. Well, so they are, and them. we're actually going to offer an opportunity for everybody and I'll, uh, to have long-term access to the videos in return for some reviews and things like that. So, uh, and I'll, we'll be putting out an announcement uh, about that. And as far as the assignments go, we're going to keep that open for another two weeks. We totally recognize that people do not. Do not, I mean, it's it's great to tell people, oh, you've got all these signs, you put these together, it'll really help, but people are busy in their own lives and it's very difficult to do, so we're gonna, we're definitely gonna keep it open. So, um, I'll, you know, I'll be putting an announcement out about like that. Tendai, I think, just joined us. Um, unfortunately, we're just ending up, but Tendai, um, I think you had a problem joining us. Are you there? I'm not sure if he did say he joined us. Here he comes. Hello. <laughs> there he is. Tendai, we missed you. I don't know what happened. I don't know if you can hear us. I'm not Let's hearing you. But we do need to wrap it up because um, I've actually got another appointment as well. But I thank you guys so much for sharing um, in this. And I hope any, you know, I think there were a couple people watching. Hopefully they uh, enjoyed it and can relate to it as well. And I'll, I'll be definitely putting the link out to the rest of the class. Uh, the Nova website for you guys will be open for a couple of months to be able to come back in and still network with people through the site. Unfortunately, for you guys, there is a brand new page that NovaWed just created uh, that can allow for teams to work together on a page. So that's a good thing. So I think we're not getting Uh oh. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Something was on. Tendai, something's wrong with your sound, and we're going to have to get off anyway. So, thank you again for joining us, and thanks for taking the class, and I uh, hope to see you in Venture Deals. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You guys want to stay on. <laughs>